Warning, do not listen to this podcast if hearing about freedom and liberty is not legal for you in your community. And if so, you should immediately move to a hipper community. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Podcast, a weekly web lab where Michael W. Dean and Nima Vadadi cover the punk rockinist, hip hopinist current events, as well as timeless universal truths about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because there's no such thing as half free. The Freedom Fiends Podcast, available from freedomfiends.com. That's F R E E D O M F E E N S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network at LRN.FM. Welcome to the Freedom Fiends Distance Learning Anarchy Series with Freedom Fiends Michael W. Dean. Broadcasting from my windowless bunker. And Nima Vidati. Go, go, Freedom Fiends! Yo, Freedom Fiends. Yo, Welcome. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. I, we're doing I'm one half of the Freedom Fiends, apparently. Yeah, you did a great interview with uh <laughs> Garrett Fox yesterday. I got to learn what you secretly think about me. It was Mr. pretty cool. Fox. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> what well, what I liked some I mean I liked it. It was like, you know, you your your criticism of me was my strong points and you knew that you were like yeah michael's really like obsessed about making sure the media is archived forever in case we get droned and i'm just not that <laughs> organized and i'm like yeah you know that's how we get stuff done i mean that's how the other day i decided while you were out eating burgers in dallas i was like <laughs> we're going to have fiends buttons and i created yes. them ordered them paid for them got emberly to be the person you know sending them out for people had them shipped to her had some shipped to you and me they're on our way it's all yes. good, man. Fiends buttons. Yes, th there was no criticism in that. I was, I was I saying it was, it was because of your passion. Also, yeah, I was, I was very thankful for for your obsession with it. I know. You know, I do not have that uh, first podcast we did that was before the Freedom Fiends. Where oh, I, you don't. It was for like mm. that was for the Nestlandia podcast or Nestlandia yeah. website or something. It's not yeah. archived on Kitty no, Feet man. somewhere. No, it's not. No, I oh, wiped bummer. out Kitty Feet before I changed it from my to, to Anarchy Gumbo. art site to Anarchy Gumbo. Yeah, I've had that domain uh. for fifteen years, but yeah, I I was like it was like a purging. It was like there's nothing on there I'll never need again, and I deleted it all. And now there's a few things I wish I'd kept. <laughs> Speaking of Anarchy Gumbo, my wife has um, become more enamored with Anarchy once she realized it, realized it was associated with various foods like Anarchy Gumbo and uh, the classic <laughs> Anarchy Burger. Hold the government. Yeah, Hold the government. That, I'm going to put that Vandal song in the, uh, in the pod link. Anarchy Burger, yeah, hold the government, which is... Really, there's. It's all about chaos. It's not about anarchy. It it's is like you know. But it's great. Say fuck in front of your mom. Well, that's kind of anarchy. You do that, but uh, you know, <laughs> go to school naked was a line in it. It was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, wonderful song and great chorus too. Like I, it almost made me want to sample it and you know half speed it and turn it into a hip hop song. Although I'd probably have to do more than half speed it because it sounds like it's at 200 BPM or something. <laughs> you know, I was looking at uh, at. CNN or something, they have, you know, those like top 15, blah, 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 and it's different stuff. And they had one that was like uh, 15 detention slips from high school that you wouldn't want to get. And, you know, a lot of them were like, you know, he jumped up on the desk and grabbed his crotch and said, right here, <laughs> bitch. But some of, a couple of them were like people, kids correctly correcting the teacher and getting in trouble for it. And I loved it because I used to do this all the time. There was one where it was like the teacher was saying, that a kilometer is longer than a mile and the class was all nodding and going oh wise teacher and this one kid got detention for saying no a mile is longer than a kilometer you're wrong and the teacher was arguing with the kid and like you know in the detention note it said like you know i found out later he was right but that's still no excuse for his behavior really that's no excuse yeah. and that's then there ridiculous. was an and then there was another one where they were like had computer classes and, you know, they were using Internet Explorer because that's what it's set up on the school computers to use. And yeah. the kid got detention for downloading some weird program called Firefox.exe <laughs> and using it. And the teacher said, you're not doing your homework. Quit downloading and using other programs. And he, to which he said, no, it's a better browser. And he argued with me and the teacher gave him detention. 
Wow. Wow. Doesn't that about sum it up, though? I remember going through school and trying to correct teachers on a few points. Sometimes it worked, but sometimes it didn't. Like, um, sometimes I would just shut my mouth, which is that really how we want the learning environment to be? I mean, shouldn't it be about the search for truth or the search for the right answer rather than deference to authority? Yes. Um, and, you know, I did have some teachers that did respect me, like uh, my English teacher, Mr. Merle. Sometimes I would bring up a point and try to correct him, and he would say, oh, and we would look it up and go, okay, you're right. Um, I had other teachers who I guess I'll leave nameless now <laughs> who just no. got offended name and names. gave, gave me the names. stink eye. Name names. I can't remember her name, though. But Come she on, was... man. When you were sitting there – fuming at that teacher don't you wish you could say in 20 years i'll have a radio show where i can i can make fun of you in front of people no not not this particular one i'm thinking about because she was she was um other than that one instance where i called her out on something she was generally a, a decent teacher but i will i will say i uh, name a name again that i dropped in garrett fox's podcast uh mrs rupp i don't even remember her first name does anybody know their teacher's first name it's kind of rare no. uh, she was mrs rupp she was my sixth grade teacher and she physically harassed me by grabbing my arm and telling me i put her through hell and f her man mrs. so uh so you haven't been keeping up on uh, updating the cz and streaming server so i did it for you last night Oh yeah, my bad with the Sunday show. Yeah, we're updated to current now. But okay, I'll let okay. you do this one. Yeah. Okay. So Thank I've, you. I've been working on this uh, new product service website, product slash service slash website that I can't say what it is yet, but I'm working on it with this white hat hacker dude, Hero, and uh, it's going to. I mean, it's something that could go public. It's like real, you know, great business model, and uh, it's going to be something that I'll just say it'll help. It'll help artists and uh, content creators share their stuff more effectively. Yeah, man. It looks awesome. Yeah. It takes a lot of the the annoying non-creative work that goes with spreading your art if you're an artist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I feel that way a lot too. And I know a lot of artists feel that way. I mean, artists are artists because they want to create and be immersed in, in creative aspects and making something, producing something. Um but to be a successful artist, you have to be good at promoting and distributing and all this other kind of stuff or have somebody that will do it for you. And I think your new business model coming out will go a long way to helping that pressure, take that pressure off. And of, of course, I've already got someone else to do it for me. Sean, <laughs> Sean DeValley is uh, doing the uploads to it for the beta. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of okay. cool. It's like this is the first time in my life I've ever like not only been in the ground floor at something that's going to be big probably, but like – uh you know, helped create it to the point where like, you know, there's a beta test going on right now that's very useful to the fiends and I'm the only one who has a password to it. Well, me and Sean. Yeah. 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 You don't even awesome. have it. No, I don't. Because you wouldn't do it. <laughs> yeah. I could. Yeah, I, I know. Did. I know. You're busy eating burgers and going on vacation, man. That picture of <laughs> you, that picture of you on Garrett's, uh, on Garrett's pot interview with you, you uh -huh. look like an Arab prince, man. Anytime you're on vacation, you pretty much look like an Arab prince. Like an Arab prince? Oh, I'm an Arab now? That's racist. I'm Persian. I know. Me. Someone else said that to me when I posted that on Facebook. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, you, you no, look. I, I know what you mean. I look like uh, I'm living in the lack of lo I mean, luxury there, just because I'm so happy. I'm there's so something happy about there's something about like your manner of dress and even your sunglasses and just you're like leaning back. You look. You look like beyond rich, like yeah, like like you're the black sheep of the Arab oil family, you know, like oh yes, our son Nima, he he goes off and and goes with the whores in Monaco, and ugh, we have to bail him out so often. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I was buying yeah. those sunglasses, I was like, okay, okay, these make me look like I got that Arab money. We had to we had to buy him diplomatic immunity to get him, <laughs> to get him out of trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. I don't take offense. So the topic today is going to be um, is going to be drug, drug rehab, treatment history, drug treatment, and the state. But we're not going to get there yet. First, we're going to talk about libertarian or rapper. Take the quiz. Did you take that yet? Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I almost had some deja vu. Did we talk about that on the cast, or did I just well, look that up? I just day liked it because it. no, I came up with the idea. A long time ago, I was like, you know, libertarian uh, rappers are almost libertarian if they just have yeah. the non-aggression principle. I mean, you know, they're into weed, they're into guns, they're into gold, 
They don't like the cops. They're practically libertarians. And yeah. well, somebody, I, t- I talked about that on my interview with Free Talk Live when I first made Eye on Me as well. That was before I ever – I never heard that. I heard you talk about that. I have to go back and find uh, that now But because uh, yeah. I am a Nima Vadati completist. <laughs> but, what does uh, that mean? It means I want to hear everything you've ever done. Oh. oh I'm a okay. fan. You know, I'm Excellent. not just your co-host. I'm a fan. So, uh, yeah, but Mother Jones magazine, which is a lefty magazine, which, you know, I mean, I agree with half of what they say and half of it's horrible. They were kind of making fun of Ron Paul. Yeah. And they had a, a, a quiz called Libertarian or Rapper. And it had a bunch of quotes, you know, and you'd pick Libertarian and Rapper. And I got like three out of ten, man. I thought it was all rapper stuff. <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, like one was like favorite piece of jewelry was a gold chain dollar a dollar sign in gold you know on a chain and i was like rapper and it's like nope and ran wore that you know <laughs> well do you want to go through and you can give me the quiz and see how well i yeah did? yeah let's do that right now i'll open it up okay and uh you know i was watching the ron paul speech at tampa today it was friggin' great he just basically bashed the hell out of the gop and called him tyrants it was wonderful yeah I didn't see that, but I did see his interview with Neil Cavuto at the convention. And Cavuto kept like pressing me. He's like, so, so you're here, but you're not going to endorse Mitt Romney and, and Paul Ryan? You're not going to endorse the ticket? And Ron Paul was like, uh, no, <laughs> they don't talk about what I want to talk about. Okay. And he was very, he's very polite, but very, very much firm in his position, which is yeah, one of the things like, I love and you about were like, Paul. You're like, was it was it the fat guy? You know who you did an interview with the fat guy on Fox. I'm like, which one? Yeah, that's like saying the which blonde one? bimbo on Fox. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although Neil Cavuto is kind of cool. I don't want to just reduce him to that. I don't want to be fattest. You know, you know I've I know. got quite a belly myself now. I know. Well, I've lost like four pounds <laughs> on the uh, paleo, the modified paleo diet in a week. Have you? So, nice. Yeah. When you say mo- how did you modify it? <laughs> um. Well, like. But with true paleo diet, you never have any milk, but I'm having like milk in my coffee, which means I'm having okay. like two tablespoons of milk a day, but I usually drank a gallon of milk a day. So it's, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. Libertarian or rapper. Take the quiz. Oh, also on the, um, on the Ron, the Daily Paul site, there was a thread about what can we do in Tampa to stir up shit and, and not stir up shit, but like, you know, promote Ron Paul. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. People formulated a plan. It was to start a pirate radio station bl- blasting Ron Paul speeches and then uh, drive it around in a car and then get um, have a projector, a you know, digital projector projecting, you know, like 91.3 FM all over town driving around. And the link they had for the how to do the radio station was to the Freedom Fiends uh, Make Your Own Liberty Station for $250 oh, article nice. by our friend Cash Newman. Nice. Yep. That's awesome. Uh, and speaking of Mother Jones and Ron Paul, before we get into the Libertarian Rapper quiz, uh, did you see their, their write-up on Rob, Ron Paul supporters rebelling on the convention floor? Yeah. And that picture of that guy flipping both <laughs> flipping birds. Flipping the saying, bird. I know. Fuck you, tyrants. F you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I tweeted that and said, like, oh, those damn, what did I say? Those damn uppity Ron Paul supporters destroying the unity of the GOP. <laughs> I don't think it was quite that long. That and the URL wouldn't fit on Twitter. Writing Twitter is like writing a telegram, man. It's like, you yeah, know, you're, paying, you're almost paying by the word. You're so limited by it. Yeah. What is it, 150 characters? And, something like that. I don't know, 62 or something. It's, 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 it's a annoying. short sentence and a shortened link, you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, yeah, I, then I posted that somewhere else and said, Republicans about to become ANCAPs. <laughs> I can't wait, Welcome. man. I can't wait to have their uh, <clears throat> support and donations November 7th. <laughs> yeah. We got to yes. do an ad. We got to do an ad and, like, maybe. W- welcoming it, Ron Paul, folks. You know, get it somewhere that isn't just our closed little big world. Okay. Yeah. Although, you, speaking of Ron Paul and uh, Rand Paul, you said in his speech, his son Rand introduced him and you just skipped through it. Yeah, I listened. I thought it was going to be like a minute long. It was like 15 minutes long. And I'm like, I don't want to hear this Ron Paul light tyrant, man. Get to the, you know, don't bore us. Get to the chorus. Song I don't even think he's Ron Paul light. I know. He's I, I Ron Paul he's fake. A, he's Ron Paul fake. Yeah. What yeah. is that? Ben did a whole... He's, he's, He's Crystal Pepsi. He's something yeah. completely different, but wrapped up in similar packaging. No, he's like generic Mexican cola that has rat poison in ah. it or something. <laughs> because yeah. the, that's how the free market works, man. You get rat poison <laughs> in your cola, according to <laughs> statists. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's take the libertarian or let's let's quiz 
libertarian rapper Nima Vidati. All right. Now, don't try to guess like, oh, this is a trick question. Just say like which you think it is. Okay, was this a rapper or a libertarian? Licked whipped cream off the chests of two bucks and women at Leukemia Society luncheon. Uh, if it was a libertarian, I would guess Robert P. Murphy, but I think this is probably a rapper, so I'm going to go with rapper. Incorrect. Really? 2008 Libertarian Party presidential candidate Rob Barr. <laughs> Bob Barr? Oh my Bob God. Barr, yeah. He's sorry. so square. I know. I didn't even consider him a libertarian, though. Well, so I, always I... Thought he, I always thought he looked like a, a porn star. He was a retired <laughs> porn star. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it does. Next. Quote, I learned to earn because I'm righteous. There's got to be a rapper. Yeah. Eric B. and Rakim paid in full. Ah, okay, okay, great. Quote. Hold on, it doesn't say if it was Eric B. or Rakim, and I don't remember which one it was. Who said okay. that exactly? I can't go okay. back. Oh, yeah. Okay, all right. fair enough. S quote, who said, so you think mo that money is the root of all evil? Have you ever asked what is the root of money? Um, it doesn't really rhyme or have too much of a rhythm to it, so I'm going to say that was a libertarian. <laughs> okay. Correct. Ayn Rand, yeah. Atlas Shrugged. Oh, and the like the buttons you pick on, the libertarian one is a picture of Ron Paul, and the rapper one is like, I don't know who it is. I think it's a generic rapper or someone from the 80s. It might be like Eric B. and Rakim or like even like... Uh, no, I, I think it's the don't copy that floppy rapper. Is it? <laughs> no, <laughs> but it would be funny it's if It's someone was. from that era. They're wearing like, you know, a fedora and a leather jacket and an Izod shirt and like tipping their hat. It's, it's such dude. a small picture. Let me try to zoom in and see if I can. All right. Uh, I, I have no idea, man. Indicted, ahead, indicted in 2009 for failure to pay taxes for three years, accused of treating his nonprofit like a personal ATM. Hmm. If the state, well, see, the state goes after rappers and libertarians, so that that's tough to tell, too, who got knocked on that. Uh... Uh, this is just a guess, but I'm going to go with rapper. Incorrect. Bill Sizemore, Oregon anti-tax activist and former libertarian gubernatorial candidate. Huh. Don't know who that is. So what am I, two, two, two and two now? I uh, don't know until we're done. Okay. At okay. press time, the IRS was dodging him for owing $6.6 million in back taxes. The, oh, the IRS was dogging him for owing $6.6 million yeah. in back taxes. At press, oh, the press time of this story. Yeah. Well, let me see when the yeah. story was posted. You're overthinking these, man. It's like a Rorschach test. Come on. Okay, bang, fine. Bang, 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 bang. Um, um, rapper. Correct. Suge Knight. Ah, ah. Hmm. Okay. Favorite article of bling, gold dollar sign pin. I think that's a misdirect. I'm going to go with libertarian. Yeah, I already told you that. It was uh, Ayn Rand. Oh, okay, okay. <clears throat> but you forgot because you're baked. I'm not baked. <laughs> okay, quote, cash rules everything around me. Oh, duh. Wu-Tang Clan, rapper. Yep, from the song C-R-E-A-M. Cream. That stands for cash rules everything around me. Yep. America needs fewer laws, not more prisons. Uh, libertarian. <clears throat> Correct. James Bovard from Lost Rights. Ah, there you go. Shocked fans with his 2008 release, Legalize All Drugs. Ooh. See, that could go either way, too. 2008 release. Um, 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 um. Say Libertarian. Guns and Weed, The Road to Freedom should be in this. I mean, that, It should. So, it but should. that'd be both. It'd be Libertarian rapper. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're correct. John Stossel. Nice. All right. Quote, I'm all for America. Fuck the government. Mm, well, I'd say a lot of libertarians in the public eye are kind of not square statist, but, you know, polite. So I'm going to say rapper on this one. Eminem in Rap Game. Ah, that's actually a great song. It's with you him got, in 50 Cent. You got eight out of ten. I got three out of ten, man. I thought they were all <laughs> rappers. They all sounded like rappers to me. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Well, I guess I know about more rap more about rappers than you. So that's a big surprise. Well, I should hope so. Yeah. I'm just I just play one on TV. You are one. <laughs> there you go. So did you see Breaking Bad the other day? 
No, I, I'm going to wait until the season's over so I can watch it in its entirety. Okay, Plus, well, I don't have... Is there a way to watch that on demand? Yeah, it's called BitTorrent. Yeah, but that's still the same. I have to download the whole thing, and then I have to wait. You know, I guess I guess I could do that. Dude, anyway. I don't know. With, with Breaking Bad, I like to sit there and watch it over the course of, like, a day or two. I mean, I don't recommend anyone using BitTorrent illegally, so yeah. scratch that. Um, I have a prediction, and to people who haven't seen this season or the last episode, this is a, uh, what do you call it? Spoiler? Yeah. Should I plug my I ears? Want, I was going to say deal breaker. Yeah, okay, plug your ears. No, I'll um, listen. Okay. Screw it. I predict that Mike is not really dead. He's going to limp to Mexico across the river and get stitched up by Gus's doctor and come back gunning for Walt, probably with Jesse's help. That's why in the previous scene of the first episode of this season, Walt was buying a machine gun. Hmm. So Mike is the new villain? I was one, yeah. you don't want you don't want to get too far into it. I was yeah. I was wondering what they were going to do because the thing with Breaking Bad is I always wonder how the hell they're going to top the the, the last episode. Well, and the last honestly, season. I hate Walt now, and I like Mike, and I like Jesse. Oh, really? Oh. I mean, we sound like a couple of ladies talking about their soap operas, but you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, I always had problems with Walt, though. There are always things I found really questionable morally about his actions um most specifically when jesse's heroin addict girlfriend and and they were sleeping together Walt he let her by. die he let her die. yeah they're both passed out and she starts to yak we talked and, about that though about that was sort of self-defense because she was going to put him in a cage for the rest of his life yeah i suppose i and he still, didn't I, kill her he just didn't help her yeah. In yeah. some states, that's not even a, a crime in our current system. You know, in some states it is, but uh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. It just put a bad taste in my mouth for Walt, I guess. No, no homo. So you turned me on to a video about the Kansas City Police Department making a propaganda video to get people used to SWAT raids. Like, SWAT raids are your friend. Here's what to do when they happen in your neighborhood and how to behave. Yes, it's disgusting. <laughs> I actually um, saw it from a Will Grigg post. He, he posted that, and I, I watched it. And the thing that struck me, first of all, was, huh, okay, so Kansas City Police Department's public information office actually is making TV news packages to make themselves look good. And that was the format of them. They look exactly like how you know uh, a local TV station would cover a They probably air them news on TV. You know? They might. I, I bet they like uh, hand them off to the different TV stations, and if they're short on content, they'll play them. Because I, I know yeah. back in Wyoming, we used to have the Department of Fish and Hogs would always give us <laughs> a weekly thing that we'd play on the weekends and... Who was who else? Oh, the Department of Transportation. So it looks like the police department in Kansas City is now doing this because there was more than just one. It was more than the the SWAT teams are your friends kind of thing. <laughs> um, there was also one about um, you know officers getting more in, into patrol and they're your friends. And and they basically interviewed like twelve different cops in that one, and each one had the same catchphrase. Like they all had a meeting about what to say on this thing, and uh, their their catchphrase was "I'm an officer first. and it was yes. just completely canned and lame. And I, I guess the thing, and this was Will Griggs' point too about the the SWAT team one, is, I mean, why? It, it, it's it's very disconcerting that they're going to such lengths to to normalize this kind of military behavior, to normalize the fact that there'll be tanks patrolling your neighborhoods, and, and you better get used to it. And it's a good thing, kind of thing. Well, uh, you have you have great insight to that that a lot of people don't because you worked in the mainstream media and. Uh, Pete Ayer from Cop Block had me write an article about guns and weed for Cop Block, which came out today. I'll link it. It's called Why I Had to Make the Movie Guns and Weed the Road to Freedom. And uh, I suggested that he have you write an article about, you know, how the an insider's view of how the news works with the cops to be their mouthpiece. And yeah, uh, yeah. he liked it and you're going to work on it. So Yeah, I am. And, um, you know... This SWAT team thing, it was almost like cutting out the middleman because the media does this kind of thing and the and even media does it 
the police department usually has a big say over how it's portrayed. Um, for instance, I did a package when I was in Washington State where they were doing SWAT training. It was like county to county. So the county I lived in and the next door county were working together to get their SWAT team to do a practice. It's one of those mock terrorism situations where they, they close down a school you know, on a weekend and they do like a fake Ugh. terrorism thing and they have students be actors and all this kind of gay stuff. Um, and the the guy who was in charge of it, the SWAT captain, he was he was so reticent. Like all the other reporters left early to get their deadline, but I was working on the night shift, so my story wasn't due till ten. And he was he was pretty miffed, it seemed, that I had stayed later to actually get the results of the exercise because it's uh, civilians. I think were actually shot by the cops in the exercise. There there were some there were some mishaps, and there were some officers that were shot as well by the uh, the perpetrator. And the captain sort of didn't didn't really want this kind of stuff to be out there. He just wanted there to be nice video of these strong men and with big guns trying to protect you. Um, he didn't really want it to be an issue of tactics. Oh, and that's the other thing they always do. They, they never want to explain their tactics or their methods or the strategies. But I feel like, shouldn't that be kind of open source stuff? If, if there are in, supposed employees, um, so when, no, when because their tactics are breaking in the door of people who uh, it's not proved they've done a crime and throwing a flash bang, bang grenade in to disorient them and wake them up and shooting any pets or people who get in the way or bark. Right. I mean, I understand completely why they don't want their tax tactics to be espoused, but I do wonder why the public doesn't demand this kind of transparency from them more. <laughs> because... Because of things like this video, yeah, yeah, and and the news, you know, giving the the free pass and the hey, you're all great kind of thing. All right, let's take a little, uh, go sell some things here, and then come back and m drop some mad science about drug rehab in the state. All right, sounds good to me. Hi, I'm Michael Dean from the Freedom Fiends, and like you, I'm concerned with privacy on the internet. The electronic police state is strangling our previous protections, and the central scrutinizer is trying to squint into all areas of our lives. That's why smart people surf the net with a VPN or virtual private network. I use a VPN from Bola VPN. Bola VPN has your utmost security in mind and will allow you to surf, email, and do other computing tasks without leaving a trail of breadcrumbs across the internet. Unlike many other VPN providers, Bola VPN doesn't log traffic. With Bola VPN, you can change your apparent location or disappear completely. Bola VPN has been around since 2007, which is OG in the VPN world. Bola VPN is easy to install and configure. Best of all, it can be had for less than 25 cents a day, which is a small price to pay for this much security. And if you open a support ticket saying you heard about them through the Freedom Fiends, they'll add three extra days free. That's Bola VPN at B O L E H V P N dot net. You've read books, attended lectures, and you know the Constitution well enough to know it's a well crafted blueprint to create an ever increasing federal empire. But there's still one thing missing buttons. Freedom Fiends now has buttons. We have Freedom Fiends, Anarchy Gumbo, and two designs for guns and weed the road to freedom. Wear them with pride. Use them to start conversations with statists. It's only $6 for four buttons, including shipping. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the link at the top that says buttons. What's up, Fiend? Chillin' Fiend. So, uh, I found this giant JPEG, which I'm going to list. It's from a site called drug-rehab.org. Ah, which speaking I'm, of fiends. I'm still trying to figure out what fiends. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out who, what they're a front for. You know, I mean, I can't even tell if this is just like a website with ads that, you know, shows up in high in SEO and you, uh, you know, they get paid by click or if it's an actual organization, particular organization, or if it's a front group for Scientology. I don't know. You know, Scientology has a drug rehab. Yeah. It's According called, to their website, they're a nonprofit drug and alcohol rehab referral and placement service. Yeah, so it's They've got an eight hundred number. It's probably not Scientology, but Scientology has a drug rehab called Narcanon, and I used to get confused. I used to confuse Narcanon with Naranon. Naranon is like the Narcotics Anonymous equivalent of Al-Anon. You know, it's like uh, the, for the families yeah. of drug addicts I, to get. Yeah, I didn't know they were two separate things. Right. And, you know, I could, I'd never remember, like, which is the good one and which is the scary one. And I just remember, well, narc, Narcanon's the bad one. It has the yeah. word narc, it narc, narc in, it. in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had a friend that um, somebody, you know, he was a drug addict in L.A. and he was really toe up. You know, he's like, used to be a 
well-known musician and then, you know, like gold record having musician and then, uh, you know, ended up homeless. And one of his friends was like, you know, I can help you. And he took him to this place and they basically kidnapped him. Like after 12 hours, they would not let him leave. And it wasn't, <clears throat> they had no legal right to do that. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't like a being committed kind of thing or even self-committed. It was just like they brought him there and he was like, mm. after 12 hours, he was like, he wanted to leave yeah. because they were spooky, he thought. And, uh, you know, they, they were like, no, you, you came in, you can't leave. And he finally like started screaming the names of, you know, people they've heard of that he said he was going to get them to get lawyers and uh, they let him out. <laughs> huh. So how did, did he eventually, they let him leave and he went back to being an addict or did he cure himself? Uh, he went back to being an addict and then later went to a non-scary inpatient program that he was brought in by something called MAP, which is Musician, Musician's Assistance Program. I have uh, no idea whether they're like government funded or not, but from what I know about them, they're a good organization. I know a lot of people in LA. Um, basically, if you're a musician, you know, who's put out a record. Like, you don't even have to be famous. If you're a musician, like, they'll help pay for your treatment, you know? Oh, okay, okay. Yep. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he actually went through a kind of nice place because he had uh, Musician's Union Insurance. Uh, ah, okay, yeah, I've heard <laughs> of that. They've, they've got posters for that around the Austin area guitar centers, like up on the bulletin board. Yeah, like, you'll get insurance. But, you know, it was also like, you know, I think his record company paid or something. I mean, the guy was, I'm not going to say who he was, but he was, uh, you know, somebody that's been on the cover of Spin and Rolling Stone and has gold oh. records and, you know, played okay. played Woodstock 2 and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I guess the thing about drug treatment and drug addiction in America is it's kind of murky. There are, I mean, there is something to be said for people who are true addicts and need help and want help and seek it voluntarily from organizations that do it. But it's been so tainted by the state. It's sometimes hard to separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. Um, and even the and organizations that run on a shoestring budget and do good work that get some funding from the state and a lot from private donors. Like for instance, I'm thinking of the Haight-Ashbury Detox Clinic in San Francisco, which I got clean through their outpatient program and then basically stayed clean by going to meetings and changing my whole life. Um, the I was talking with a girl that I know that used to be my roommate. She and her boyfriend were junkies and both. They're, now they're both clean. We got clean around the same time, 93, 94. And uh, you know, I was talking to her about libertarianism and she liked the idea of it, but she's like, you know, her think of the roads. She didn't even bring up the roads. She was like, well, how would addicts get sober if there weren't government funded places like <laughs> the place you got sober, Michael? Like she was basically calling me a hypocrite for bad mouthing yeah. government after getting clean through a place that gets, you know, 10% of its funding from the government and the rest from wealthy patrons who, you know, went through there. Yeah. Uh, and a and lot I, of the, and a lot I was of the like, I was like, you know, the structure of that kind of place is such that it's become dependent on the 10% from the government. Yep. If they'd never had it, they'd still be around, man. They, they, yep. they do a good service and people would provide something for them. Yeah, exactly. But a lot of them fall into that trap. Uh, the government court orders people to go to drug rehab at a for-profit and then pays the, for the for-profit uh, or forces the... Um, the person who was court ordered to pay for it themselves, which basically gives them guaranteed customers, and they they sort of have to build their business model around it. And they become dependent on that kind of money, which, which isn't true market which money. What we're going to talk about today a lot of is going back into the history of how long that's been happening and how it happened. But um, yeah, I mean, I have a friend who's not a libertarian who got busted about ten years ago for you know pulled over for drunk driving, and he he had you know blew a whatever, like barely drunk, but he had some Coke on him, like a gram or something. Uh. And the judge, uh, you know, he spent a couple nights in jail and then the judge ordered him to go to, to AA meetings, which he, this guy to the, to this day hates AA and says it's horrible and it's evil. And I tried to explain to him like, no, you know, AA isn't anything to do with the state. The judge ordered him, you know, and I guess AA meetings could say, <clears throat> Well, some do. I mean, basically, when you get court ordered, they give you a card to sign, and the the secretary of the meeting signs it for you. And some secretaries, including me, when I ran an NA meeting, will not sign that card. You know, uh, they're like, go to another meeting where they'll sign it, or sign it yourself, or you know, whatever. 
uh, because I, I think an important part of 12 step programs is that it is voluntary. Even yeah. Dale Everett, who I interviewed recently, who's, you know, stone cold atheist. I mean, stone, stone cold agnostic. <laughs> Sorry. No, he's actually a uh, uh, Quaker. He's a stone cold anarchist. anarchist. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you know, has a problem with AA because he thinks it's connected to the state. And I explained to him, no, it's not, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. Right, right. Yeah. <sighs> you know, that was actually one of the examples I put in my letter of resignation for the news station was um, – this woman I had interviewed, I did a story, you know, they they love to do budget cut stories and, and show, uh, look at these poor people who aren't getting this money because the state had to cut the budget, you know, kind of a thing to make you want the state to not cut the budget. And I interviewed this woman at one of these, these it was an actual business, it was a voluntary business, a private business that did rehab, but a lot of their customers were court ordered or were forced to go there um, by the state or the state paid for it, various different government and state pseudo ties. And this one woman I interviewed, um, she was she was just a mess. Um, and they, they made it seem like the meth was the real villain in, in her life. But to me, in her, in her story, it seemed like the state was the real villain. She couldn't yeah. afford she couldn't afford to pay for rehab herself because her husband was in jail. The only reason her husband was in jail was for a nonviolent meth offense. So if the state didn't lock up her husband, throw her husband in jail, she would have the money to volunteer, and he would have the money too, to voluntarily admit themselves to a rehab, get clean. They'd still have their daughter uh, or their son or whatever. They had a kid that basically had to be taken in by child protective custody. They would have had a, a whole family. They could have gotten better, at least ideally. They could have gone to rehab and gotten better. And and their kid wouldn't have to go live in a foster home or in a center and be essentially an orphan. And and the villain in all this was so obviously the state, not the meth. I mean, the meth is a problem, but yeah. the meth isn't the meth isn't a cage that her husband is staying in. The meth I, didn't take her kids away. I knew, I've known a lot of drug addicts in my day, back from using, and from in meetings, you know, recovering addicts and people trying to get clean who didn't. I've actually known, I've known a bunch of opiate users. Who had totally functional lives and could have forever. The guy who co-founded the Hate Ashbury Detox Clinic, uh, his daughter was my girlfriend, which is was really kind of weird. But um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, he told he also used to be Charles Manson's parole officer before he started that clinic. And there's mm -hmm. another connection. It's like he was a parole officer and then he went to start a clinic. But uh, he was a good guy, and but he told me, you know, stimulants will destroy your body and nobody can use them recreationally for long term but if you could get clean heroin you know that's medically pure uh you could use it and be uh, and and you didn't have to like pay for it you know steal to pay for it if it didn't have an artificially inflated price mm -hmm. you could do heroin every day of your life and be you know an old fairly happy healthy person yeah when you die of old age at 85 or 90 you know he said the thing that kills addicts is you know, the crimes they do, you know, getting shot in a robbery or getting killed in jail or whatever, uh, you know, the starvation, you know, the bad lifestyle you have to live because it's illegal and what, you know, often like diseases they get from sharing needles, yeah, you know, yeah. hepatitis or uh, HIV. I would tend to think those are the majority of the problems. I still think even if there were no state to, you know, do these horrible things to people who like to take certain substances, I still think there would be people who maybe would abuse it to its end. Just like now there are people that die of alcohol poisoning. I think there could be a small percentage of people that would die from heroin overdose or morphine overdose. But why ruin society to prevent a few deaths like that uh, ostensibly when these drug laws don't even prevent those deaths? They make everything worse. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, uh, you know, I mean, there, I have actually met people who recreationally used speed for decades. Uh, you know, they generally had fewer teeth than the people that recreationally used heroin for decades. But college um, students use Adderall all the time, which is an am amphetamine. I mean, that's its medical name, amphetamine. You know, we basically addressed this really well, I think, in the Guns and Weed movie with the line we wrote for Jay Tizzle where, uh, you know, should race cars be outlawed? How about boxing, camping in bear country? Those are all like drug use, doing something dangerous and exhilarating for kicks. You know, yep. camping in bear country is encouraged by the state. I mean, Wyoming, <laughs> Wyoming, you know, the, the whatever Department of 
commerce or the, you know, whatever, fish tourism, and hogs. fish and hogs. <laughs> I mean, you know, they take ads out in California saying, yeah, you know, visit, visit beautiful uh, Jellystone Park, Yellowstone and, National and, Park. And billboards in Salt Lake City and I'm sure Denver. Yeah. 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 They steal your money to promote that dangerous activity. <laughs> Yeah, Which and, I engage know, in because it's a blast. I last, love camping. The last couple years, a couple people been mauled and or killed by bears in Yellowstone, not camping, just walking around, man. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, they're off the beaten track and hiking and, you know, trying to feed them Doritos or pet their young or something. But, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> feed Doritos to the bears. Win a big warrior. <laughs> Dead Kennedys. That's a great song. Yeah, I love that. It sounded sound like the Dead Kennedys. Feed Doritos to the bears. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so do we want to get into the, the, yeah, the history? Yeah. Okay. You've got some notes on it. Do you want to... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll sort of go through some of these, and you can catch whatever you think I miss. You know, follow along in your actual timeline, and tell me if there's anything you think needs to be commented on. Okay, um, I'm going to jump in with the, the like to show where this starts. It starts in the 1700s to early 1800s. The first alcoholic mutual aid societies or sobriety circles are formed within various Native American tribes. Later, some will evolve into abstinence-based temperance organizations. Now, look at that. That's the state caused a problem. The state came in and brought alcohol to Indians who couldn't <laughs> handle it metabolically. Uh, you know, that's, that's, I mean, there's like the cliche of the drunken Indian, but it's like literally that's a race of people that, unlike most of the rest of the world, didn't touch alcohol until the 1700s, you know, yeah. and settlers brought it and traded it for their land and their pelts. But, yeah, uh, but even then, their solution, the Native American so- solution, was sobriety circles, which seems pretty stateless. Like it seems yeah, like you know, but if, if you were later, some evolved into abstinence-based right. temperance organizations. <laughs> temperance organizations are people who morally and legally want to outlaw everyone drinking. Yeah, yeah, and that's that sort of seems to be uh, the thread that goes through the timeline of the history of drug rehab is uh, it's a story of the state taking control of an issue that the market was already working right, on. Right. I mean, mutual aid societies. That's a perfect description for AA, which came much you know two hundred years later. Uh, it's a great idea. It's friends helping friends. It's totally market based. It's non state based. It's mm-hmm. you know it's. Four people meeting in their living room, which is illegal now. Did you hear about, uh, it wasn't an alcohol thing, but some guy in, I think it was Kansas City or something, got arrested and put in jail for having a Bible meeting in his house because it broke yep. the law of having too many people in his living room. Yep, yep. It was like a public meeting thing. Like yeah. you have to apply for a permit uh, from the city to have that large of a, a meeting. <laughs> well, you know, the the first, um, I started an NA meeting and, you know, you're supposed to be anonymous with NA. That's the A is alcohol is anonymous, you know, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous. But I, I no longer consider myself a member so I can break my anonymity without harming the organization or myself, which, you know, they have some really excellent um, bylaws or suggestions for not only getting sober, but for uh, running the groups, you know, the the, mm-hmm. the the originator of it, Bill Wilson, called AA a mixture, uh, a, you know, a perfect or a, a useful mixture of anarchy and democracy, yeah. which yeah. which we talked about is like, well, that doesn't make sense, but it does if it's panarchy. You know, you can choose yep. to have your democracy, and it is. Exactly. So the first, I started this NA meeting called Lust for Life in San Francisco, because when I first yeah. got sober in 94, there were... You know, all the meetings were like old people and bikers and, you know, not young hip people. And I felt out of place and they were staring at me because, you know, me and my friends had purple hair or something. So I started Lust for Life and it became very successful and did really well for 10 years. Like, you know, four years after I moved out of San Francisco, it was still going strong. Um, And it, it met in a room at a rehearsal studio. And the lady who run the play, ran the place, you know, her son was an addict, which is not... You know, I'm not saying what studio it was or who she was, but, you know, it's common knowledge. And this guy has like, I've seen him stand on stage and go like, I love to shoot dope and bang groupies. So you know, <laughs> I'm not breaking his anonymity. And uh-huh. she she allowed us to have it there free, ho- probably hoping her son would come in, you know, mm-hmm. um, and he did for a while. Eventually, maybe I think he's sober now. So, uh, you know, we had this great meeting room at a rehearsal space like you'd hear shitty bands rehearsing downstairs really loud in this place which was really cool (laughs) yeah and i actually thought of the name of it while i was having sex with a black woman 
I was, <laughs> you know, we were, at first we were going to call the meeting like hip slick and cool recovery or something, which is horrible because the AA, the AA has, has a saying of like, you know, if you're too hip slick and cool, you can't make it in recovery. Like uh, basically saying okay. like, if your ego gets in the way, you're not going to make it, which yeah. is true, but you can be hip slick and cool. So, uh, I was calling it like something like hip slick and cool recovery for the first two meetings. And then I was like, that's a horrible name. And I was having sex with this hot black chick. And I was like, what's her name? Life. No, nah, I'm not going to say her name. Okay. But, okay. uh, I like that. And I thought of it while I was doing it. Uh, so the first meeting of the first two meetings of that were public meetings at our house before we got the rehearsal space. We, we actually like put up signs at other, handed out signs at other, you know, handbills at other meetings and, uh, invited people with my address on it to have it in my backyard, which is mm. kind of a scary thing to do with recovery because it's like yeah, inviting I would think. addicts who might still be using to your house. Steal your TV and get a shit. fix. But we actually did it in the backyard without them coming into the house. We had them go through the alley and just stood out front for the first 10 minutes. And, you know, the first meeting had like three people at it. The next meeting had five. And then we brought it to the rehearsal studio and it had like, you know, between 20 and 50 every meeting for 10 years. So, yep. 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 Yeah. Did did the state ever come in and break up the party, or do you know what, no, what the current status is? No, but is? there's actually something in the beginning of each NA meeting that's something about, like, we. it's called We Do Recover, and it's something they read at the beginning of every meeting, and it's actually, and in it it says one thing is the lie is dead, we do recover. And that's based on the fact that uh, when NA started, it first started in the, like, 50s, because AA started in the 30s, and... Addicts would go to AA meetings because there wasn't something for addicts. And mm -hmm. AA people would sometimes throw them out because they didn't want them there. So yeah. in the 50s, with the blessings of AA, NA took the 12 steps and started NA. And it didn't really catch on until the 70s. And in the 70s, it started getting popular in New York City and LA. And police used to drive... You know, they drive the, the rookies around in their car and they drive by the N.A. meeting and say, like, see those people standing there smoking cigarettes in front of that church basement? Memorize their faces. Bust them whenever you can. Oh, my God. That's awful. And so originally N.A. meetings were secret meetings and they were by candlelight. Um, and then there was this guy named Frank Buchanan who I've met. He passed away a few years ago. He was like 80 really cute old gray haired man that used to wear a suit and like a flower on his lapel all the time. And all the young girls loved him cause he was cool and he was a rock star in AA and NA. And I, I can say his name cause he was really open about his name and there've been articles about him. Um, Frank Buchanan went to the head of the FBI, which was what's his name? Horrible guy. The guy who wore women's underwear. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Uh, J Edgar Hoover. Yeah. He went to D.C. and got a meeting with J. Edgar Hoover and told him, I work with this organization called Narcotics Anonymous. Addicts are staying clean. The lie is dead. Please tell cops nationwide to stop targeting us for trying to get clean. And Hoover actually uh -huh. did it because, like, he brought – Frank brought reporters and stuff, and there was a spotlight on it. And so they quit having to have candlelight meetings. There's actually still some candlelight meditation meetings, which are a throwback, like an homage to the fact that they used to have to hide. Yeah. But uh, – oh, wow. Yeah, but uh, they're not secret anymore, and people do recover. Like in the seventies, you know, cops said, you know, addicts don't recover. They, you know, once an addict, always an addict. That was the lie. When they say the lie is dead, the lie yeah. was once an addict, always an addict. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right. So, what's next on our list here? <laughs> yeah, we kind of jumped ahead to the seventies and stuff, but um, in the in the seventeen eighties, actually, it's time for us to sell some things. Okay. Want to contribute to Liberty but short on cash? You can help the Freedom Fiends without even spending a post-1964 dime. Download uTorrent and start seeding Fiends episodes. Follow twitter.com slash fiendtorrents to grab the past episodes and new ones as they post. Leave your computer on seeding the torrents while you're at work or asleep. The more people seeding the Fiends, the more drone-proof we'll be when the boot comes down. That's twitter.com slash fiendtorrents. You're listening to the Freedom Fiends Podcast. Freedom Fiends is now available for 24-7 streaming to your iPhone, Android phone, or other chromed robot turd. Click on the streaming audio link on freedomfiends.com. 
That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. More fiends, please. Morphine, More fiends. please. Morphine for the Morphine Fiends. You know, there was this band in Philadelphia, a punk rock band back when my band Bomb was together called More Fiends, which had this really hot chicken that I used to have a crush on. I knew her. Ah. <laughs> More Fiends, okay. though. That's a good... It should be Fiends. But this was like 86, 87. I don't know if people said Fiends yet. as back then. In. Yeah. 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 Um, my father-in-law had surgery recently, and he... He was enamored by, by the morphine button. He was like pressing it. And he kept calling it uh, morphine. Uh, it's he, like it's like the button to God, you know. Yeah, it's like paging yeah, heaven, yeah. paging heaven. Well, he, yeah. he used to be a pharmacist, and he remembers um, some trade publication where they they uh, were making fun of this guy. They called him a criminal. He like got his hands on some prescription, you know, the, the things where you write the prescription in, and he pads, wrote like 300 prescription, prescription pads. He wrote like 3,000 th- uh, hits of morphine and spelled it like M-O-F-E-E-N. <laughs> <laughs> and he got arrested, and it was sad. Yeah. See, kids, yeah. stay in school or you'll get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> Learn the basics of spelling and math. It'll help you. When you're sitting there in class going, how will this help me in later life being able to spell? That's how it'll help you. Steal morphine more effectively. (laughs) Yeah. All right. I was going to tell a story about when I did my paid coke research at UC Parnassus in California, but uh, it'll make people fiend, so I'm not going to tell it. It'll make people fiend? Yeah. Uh, In what way? Well, for the fiends. What they did was they. Was they, you know, they're being paid by the government to take intravenous cocaine, and uh, they hooked me up to this. You know, I'm lying in a reclining chair. And they put a butterfly serrette in my arm or, you know, like one of those little things they use to put a tube in your arm, you know, mm-hmm. yeah, like if yeah. they have to do a drip um, and uh. then taped it down in my vein in the crotch of my elbow in the front. And then they hooked it up to this machine that had a syringe of clear liquid in it that had like a quarter gram of pure pharmaceutical cocaine or something, just an amazing amount, like an almost OD amount that was wonderful. And they turned on the machine, and instead of just shooting it in your vein, like if you were shooting it, which takes about you know half second, um, it took a minute to push the plunger in, and the liquid mm-hmm. was cold. Anybody out there mm-hmm. who's done coke is like getting their buttholes twitching right now. Um, it was it was like it was cold liquid. I could feel it going in my vein, and it came on kind of slowly and like more and more and more intense in waves. And then I was yeah. like, you know, when I'm a billionaire, I just want to like have that at home with a nurse, <laughs> a naughty nursey. Yeah, I I can't do it, man. I hate anything delivered intravenously. I can't even give blood. I pass out. So let's move on here. Creeps me out. Um, uh, yeah. well, I've, when I've, I've never given blood, but when I get blood tests, uh, you know, my veins are kind of fucked up. Because, you know, I used to shoot drugs. Like, there's there's scar tissue in my veins, which is yeah. another thing that's the state's fault. Because, you know, if junkies could get clean needles every time like diabetics do, that wouldn't be the problem. Yep. Uh, yep. Diabetics don't shoot in the vein, but, you know, junkies use insulin syringes. That's the, the standard. They have really small needles. and um, But, you know, they end up having to use them over and over because they're hard to get. So, mm-hmm. they get dull. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I've, I've, been give, I've been given a blood sample before and, like... Almost said to the nurse, like, here, let me do it when she couldn't find it. <laughs> and, you know, but then I'll generally say, like, well, that one's kind of tapped out. You might try this one right here in my wrist. Uh, you know, <sighs> you're not worried that they're going to call the cops and call you. No, because I, t- I tell, them I'm, tell them I'm a recovering addict. It's <laughs> that is a matter of public record, man. Yeah, it, it sure is. <laughs> and it's not illegal yet to be, yeah. you know, someone who hasn't done drugs in 20 20- Two years or whatever. Right, right. The lie is currently over. Although there's some guy that, uh, I forget if it was Canadian and they wouldn't let him into the U.S. or vice versa. I think it was Canadian writer, philosopher, teacher, university professor that they wouldn't let in the United States because they read something where he talked about taking acid in the 60s. Wow. Hmm. That's gay. I mean, that's square. All right. So moving on with the history. Moving on. So. 
So yeah, um, in 1784, founding but I, father. But I digress. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the late 1700s, there was a founding father. At least that's what this thing calls him. I don't know if it, they just say that because he was in the uh, Constitution and helped sign it or whatever. His name's Benjamin Rush. He published a study called "Effects of Ardent Spirits on the Human Mind and Body," and then he proposed a sober house to care for alcoholics. He was a founding father. Yeah, but he's not like one of the. Well, I guess I'm not a humper he signed either way. His so. name. Well, okay. I mean, stop being such an anarchist for a minute. You know what fits <laughs> the name founding father? He's Fine. not your founding Fine. father, but he is a signatory of the Declaration of Independence, and he attended the Continental Congress. That's a okay. founding father. Okay. Okay. He's founding father. Um. Anyway, still seems at that point like it's mostly stateless. Like he's not calling for force to be used or the government to be used. Um. Until uh, 1864. Well, it says it's gener- his article is generally recognized as the beginning of the American temperance movement. Temperance is not sobriety. AA is about sobriety. Temperance is a bunch of nosy, you know, sexless church ladies saying the government has to ban alcohol. Uh, like I told you, I grew up okay. in Chautauqua, New York, summered there. That was a seat of temperance, of the temperance movement. And it's still a dry town because of it. Got it, got it. So temperance was sort of the horizontal enforcement coming before the state enforcement. No, sobriety is the personal thing. Temperance is the yeah, state but that's, thing. That, that's what I mean. Temperance, because it wasn't illegal yet. There was no prohibition then. But temperance was a, a bunch of people getting together and saying it should the, be illegal. Those, so it was, people it made the horizontal. It, those people made it illegal. Right. Those people so was, lobbied the government. Yeah, yeah. So it was the horizontal enforcement before the state enforcement rather than vice versa. Yep. Yeah. So 1810, Benjamin Rush calls for the creation of a sober house to care for alcoholics. Now, I don't know if that was state run or what, but 1830, Dr. Samuel Woodward proposes asylums for the inebriated. Now, that doesn't sound voluntary. Um, that no, guy is asylum. That guy's quoted in the AA book uh, as doing some early research that led to AA. Now, 1840, the Washington the Washingtonian Society, organized by and for confirmed alcoholics, is formed. Will grow to have 600,000 members. The Washingtonian Society helped spawn AA because uh, the guy who started one of the co-founders of AA, Bill W, was Bill W and Dr. Bob. Um, Bill W was a member of the Washingtonian Society and. Um, you know, he, he got kind of drummed out of there for like talking too much and having too many ideas. And he went mm. and formed his own society. And one of the things he learned from the Washingtonian society was to keep to, was to have AA set up to have a primary, a sole purpose, which is to keep alcoholics sober. The Washingtonian society fell apart because they had too many, uh, agendas. And one of them was getting the government involved in, uh. in, you know, I don't know if banning alcohol, but uh, getting the government involved with dealing with alcohol and alcohol. Okay, okay. So I guess a lot of these early things, even though they didn't have the state involvement at the time, they were pushing for it. Is sort of what it seems like now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, according to this timeline, in 1864, the New York State Inebriate Asylum <laughs> opened uh, in 1864 and was the first of its kind in the country. And it, it, there's a little picture there, too, and it looks like this giant uh, Gotham-type building that's just <laughs> scary. Um, looks like a prison. Looks like a medieval prison. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and, and 1845, the sale of liquor is proclaimed illegal in New York, only to be repealed two years later. So, as usual, you know, New York and California leading the charge of nanny yep. shit. Of course. Yeah. Um, although there were some competing threads. I mean, I don't know if you know anything about these Keeley Institutes, but um, the timeline says in 1879, a person named Leslie Keeley said that drunkenness is a disease and I can cure it and opened uh, 120 Keeley Institutes across the United States. It was a for-profit addiction treatment center for alcohol yeah. and morphine. Um, there's a little inlay of, of one of their advertisements, and it's just like you would advertise um, a new oven for women yeah. in the 50s. Yeah, you know? in the 1850s. Uh, <laughs> and then if you look, 1891-1892, the Keeley League, a spinoff of the Keeley Institute, urges lawmakers to sentence medical treatment for alcoholics rather than jail time. That's where it begins. That's where it really begins the state getting involved 
with drug rehab. You know, right. basically and that's also like, sort of a form of corporatism because they is. stood to benefit from that with their treatment centers. If they get the state to actually right. force people to go to their treatment centers, and then they have you know uh, a customer base that's always going to be there for them. And, and b- we missed one that's kind of funny. Eighteen uh, eighties, Sigmund Freud and many other American physicians recommended cocaine as an effective <laughs> treatment for alcoholism and morphine addiction. Yeah. All right, moving on to the nineteen hundreds. Uh, as alcoholic homes close, poor alcoholics end up in drunk tanks and wards of public hospitals or asylums. The well-to-do continue to seek treatment at discreet private clinics. Mm. Yeah. You know, I really wonder, is this sort of, um, an American phenomenon? I mean, did you have something like the drunk tank in 15th century England or was everybody just drunk and didn't care at that probably point? the latter I mean you know when we're talking I was talking recently about the history of coffee and how um once coffee hit England and America the Industrial Revolution happened and mm-hmm. that was because before that water was so tainted you know despite public involvement with it water was so tainted you couldn't drink it so everybody drank beer because the alcohol in it would kill most germs so mm-hmm. everybody was going to work hammered you know, and once they they got off that and used coffee, which was also safe because you boil it. Uh, you know, productivity went from a beer based economy <laughs> to a caffeine based economy. Yes, yes. Huh. And I'm sure you like that because you are a caffeine fiend and you are very productive. Ah, uh, yeah. I got nothing wrong with alcohol, though. You know, I mean, yeah. if someone's drunk, like you know, <laughs> Garrett was the other day with me on the phone, I just get off the phone, man. <laughs> it's my pro- my brain's my private property. I'll invite you him, go. you know, I invite him back any time that he's yeah. not. I don't mind when people are a little buzzed, but when they get hammered, they get sloppy and get insulting and then want to have sex with me and my wife. <laughs> are you still talking about Garrett? Yeah. Oh. Hmm. I'm just embarrassing him in the middle of this whole thing, but I love Garrett. Okay. I love him. <laughs> and when he's ready to get sober. No, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> this is an intervention. 1924, cigarettes are illegal in 14 states. This is a podvention. No, it's not. Garrett's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't I didn't know this, that there was cigarettes or tobacco prohibition that early in American society. Also in 1924, the Senate adopts a resolution forbidding American traders from selling opium and alcohol to aboriginal tribes and uncivilized races. <laughs> yes, that's racist. We, we that is talked really a lot about, racist, man. We talked a lot about the racism of the drug war in, in Guns and Weed, but we didn't go back that early. I, mm-hmm. I, I actually mm-hmm. didn't know that they had forbid it specifically to quote unquote uncivilized races and who, who defines that like like if you take that to court if you're not white man if you're not white ah. and a member of the senate i think um right. it's 1935 uh shadell sanitarium opens introducing aversion conditioning which is you know a simple form of aversion conditioning is like putting putting vinegar on your on your kid's fingernails so he won't bite his nails because it tastes bad. You know, it's associating something bad with it, uh, which which is a short step to attack therapy, which we're going to get into a little later. But right, right, uh, which is, in, is also very similar to what happens in Clockwork Orange, where they basically brainwash him to where he'll get nauseous yeah, yeah, whenever he exactly. does the things that he likes to do. You know, one of the things Ron Paul said in his speech this week in Tampa that I loved was he said, you know, there's a book called 1984, and I read it in high school, and and it seemed like a, a cautionary tale, but I think there's a lot of people who've read it and decided it was a business plan and gone into, <laughs> pol- gone into politics. <laughs> A business wow. plan. Wow, I mean, we've great. said that's better. We've we've said it's you know a how to book, but I love that a business, a business plan. Business plan. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's okay, for their so, own profit. So the same year, 1935, the U.S. Public Health Prison, U.S. Public Health Prison Hospital, opens in Lexington, Kentucky, as the yeah. government's first intentional involvement in addiction treatment. Now, that is important like lexington it used to be like in the 40s and 50s sometimes you'll read like old hard-boiled fiction or something and they'll say like yeah that guy was messed up he he's headed nowhere but the the graveyard or lexington and like you know lexington was code for that hospital and that was that was the only option for addicts before aa and na and treatment centers Mm -hmm. um 
Right. So it's, same- it's, it's amazing to think that in, in just about 150 years, uh, American society went from private charities who ha- actually had to have advertisements to persuade addicts to get better to a federal prison hospital. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, I mean, think about that, that combination of words, prison hospital, to force yeah. addicts to get better well, for their own not, good. Not just advertisements saying, but, but, you know, Sigmund Freud and many doctors recommending cocaine as a cure for alcoholism. <laughs> to, right, to but what I mean is, 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 is you go from that to, to having in 1935 the the, the U.S. Health, public health prison hospital. I mean, not only are they forcing that, that so it's like not FEMA, voluntary. That sounds like a FEMA camp, man. The it public does, health yeah. prison hospital, right? And, and all at taxpayer expense. So yeah. not only are they forcing the addicts, but they're forcing you to pay for the addicts. Yeah. And uh, same year, 1935, Alcoholics Anonymous was formed, which is important because uh, that was a Non-governmental, free market, voluntary, non-profit thing that worked for alcoholics. And um, they actually, early on, when they started to get some press, uh, some industrialist, I think it was Rockefeller or one of those people, you know, one of the one of the people behind the curtain that runs the world actually had like, you know, said, Oh, well I could do some charity with this and had a dinner for them and invited a lot of rich and influential people and had people from AA come up and speak at the dinner. And, uh, whoever it was, I think it was one of the Rockefellers, um, gave them a gift of like $10,000. And before that night, you know, when it was being planned, Bill W who was the mover and shaker who started AA and was really, Ego driven and like when I read about when I read his biography, um, the Bill W story, pass it on. He really reminded me a lot of me, like how I just grab stuff, run with it, don't check my facts, and that's. But I get stuff done, and that's my work ethic, you know. But it, he, like him, I you know like me, he didn't always check his facts and was like, okay, this is gonna work. This is how it's gonna be. We're gonna do it this way. And when he heard that Rockefeller was gonna have this dinner for him, he was planning. Bill W. in his mind was like, yeah, and Rockefeller is going to give me billions and we're going to start <laughs> AA hospitals all over the country and uh-huh. have ads on radio 24-7. And like Rockefeller took him aside and said, like, here's 10 grand for your organization. I'm not going to give you any more because it would hurt you. You need to be self-sufficient after this. And like mm. that was part of the foundation of one of the AA traditions of it being self-sufficient. Nice. And that's what kept it from getting effed up by government involvement. Right. Right. Which is weird. It, was, it, it, was wasn't, of, it didn't just become throwing money at, at the problem, which you know brings people who are just seeking money rather than you know, people who actually which was want weird, to get better. Which was weird because it was it was in, initiated by one of the you know Illuminati kings, <laughs> but uh, you know they occasionally did some good things. Yeah, yeah. With their stolen money. <laughs> well, um, so 19, you want to? Nineteen thirty nine, Eighteenth Amendment, prohibition is ratified, causing the proliferation of organized crime. Marijuana becomes a popular replacement for booze. Sigmund yeah. Freud dies. <laughs> you, you know the the prohibition thing. I don't think we should just gloss over. I, I think it's really important, especially for people who may still believe in the Constitution or be Constitution hoppers. How can you think the Constitution <laughs> is, is set up for personal liberty? They banned the sale of alcohol constitutionally const- with the Constitution. Yeah, with with an amendment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's just because there's a piece of paper that exists uh, doesn't mean it's going to keep you free. Uh, you can't rely on, on paper for freedom. Worms. Worms. Unless it's paper made out of hemp. <laughs> With a free market and no laws. Well, some people would say, oh, well, the Constitution was written on hemp. It wasn't. Uh, it was not. Dra- the Declaration of Independence was written on hemp. Ah. The Constitution drafts of it were written on hemp, but hemp was cheaper than what they used, which was like actually like some kind of animal skin. Uh, which is more expensive, so they used the better stuff for the final draft, the ah, final okay, versions of okay. it. And actually, the, the hemp was the scratch paper, right? And when you say the Constitution, uh, you know, there's a document in Washington that's in, 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 encased in helium or nitrogen under glass. That's not the only copy of that. There were actually they printed up, you know, one for every state that signed it, and uh, uh, other ones existed, but that's the one that still exists. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, you got a piece of paper you think's gonna be around in two hundred and thirty years? Let me know. Do I? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. Hmm. Okay. 
<laughs> I have a line so in a song. I have a line in a song I wrote. It says, "When I'm long gone and spiders crawl where my brain used to be, I'll remember things about this city street, things I stole and things I did. Everything's hid underneath, underneath this lid. Open it up, and you might have some fun in life." Are you inviting people to rob your grave? Rob my brain. That's what we're doing, man. We're letting people steal our brains in this yeah, podcast. Yeah. In the podcast. You want you want to make podcast with me, Nima? <laughs> yes, let's make podcast right now. Okay. So what's next on your list? So uh, on my list, I have um, 1945 next, when successful AA members employed at major industrial companies help start modern voluntary treatment programs and employee assistance programs. Which is important because actually, like, you know, it used to be, you know, before AA, like, you'd never want to hire an alcoholic, even a, right. one that wasn't drinking because it, it was bad. But AA had so many success stories that they convinced you know, the leaders of industry, like, no, it's good to hire a recovering alcoholic. They're going to be better at their job. And right. they often were because they, you know, they had the principles of the program and they, uh, you know, they had a lot on the line. Although that doesn't always work. If you look at Robert Downey Jr., you know, how many times did the judge tell him, you know, if I ever see you in here again and his career was dead and then finally, like, you know, somebody took a chance on him and brought him back. I think it was, uh, who was the guy who was yelling about the Jews starting all the wars in the world? Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson. Yep. Um, let's stop here. There's someone at my door. I got to go get droned. I'll be right back. <laughs> You're listening to the Freedom Fiends podcast. Freedom Fiends is now available for 24-7 streaming to your iPhone, Android phone, or other chromed robot turd. Click on the streaming audio link on freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Check out the Anarchy Gumbo podcast. Michael W. Dean of the Freedom Fiends cooks up a very special blend of liberty, guns, sex, rock and roll, drugs, and thriving in spite of the state in an increasingly worrying world. All with a rotating cast of nifty guests who are also up in the middle of the night. The Anarchy Gumbo podcast, a tasty stew of freedom and fun. Subscribe at kittyfeet.com. That's K-I-T-T-Y-F-E-E-T dot com. Would you like to advertise your product or service to a large built-in audience of liberty-loving consumers who truly dig the free market? Freedom Fiends is now selling ad space. Slots are reasonably priced, but limited, so contact us today. Write the Fiends at talkback at freedomfiends.com. That's talkback at freedomfiends.com. This is the Central Scrutinizer. We're working very hard to spend your tax money to keep you from hearing things like freedomfiends.com. That's why we're very upset about freedomfiends.cz. Freedomfiends.cz is a Liberty Media Archive of Freedom Fiends material hosted in the Czech Republic. Freedomfiends.cz is outside the jurisdiction of the Watchers who employ me, the Central Scrutinizer, to keep you from hearing things that might make you think. My fellow Scrutinizers and I do not want you to visit freedomfiends.cz. Do not visit freedomfiends.cz. Go, go, Freedom Fiends! So, I'm going to open my boxes that just came UPS. You can talk. Did you survive the drone bombing? No, nah, it was UPS. 
Well, let's see what's okay, in the boxes. Good. The opposite. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's... Market, man. It was, indeed. So, so when we left you last, we were talking about how um, in 1945, successful members of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, employed at major industrial companies helped to start modern volunteer treatment programs and employee assistant programs. Um, I think one of the real things or one of the real reasons why this is important is because they went on to be successful, first of all. So even though they had that stigma of being addicts in the past, they were able to get good jobs and be employed. And then they used that success to help others. Um, compare this with state methods for addiction. You know, if you get possession that is felony, you always have to check the felony box whenever you fill out a job application. You have a hard time getting a job at Burger King or McDonald's or being a high school janitor. Those are almost closed to you. You, you can't and, be a high school janitor. You can't get a job oh, fine. at a high school you can't be a high school janitor. felony. But, but even, even small little jobs that you think are for high school teenagers or people with no experience are almost impossible to get when you have that felony distinction. So I think it's really important to see that in, in the 40s, before um, you know the, the drug war really started rolling, you had addicts that could still be successful alcoholics it was just alcoholics there was no there was no i mean drug that's alcohol addicts, addicts. i mean you know really there is no difference in alcohol is a drug and can be abused it's like alcohol is legal which is why well, this, a, this is you know, coming right off the hills of prohibition too so just a few years previous to this uh it was an illegal drug alcohol was yeah, yeah. i got new sneakers man sneakers yeah what kind i mail ordered them Sakani S S A U C O N Y. Ah, I don't know what that means. You're are they, are, hip. Are they, they get, barefoot barefoot sneakers to no, no, for your new have, primal lifestyle? They have two pairs of uh, two pair of laces in them. I don't know how that works. Oh, it's two different things. Okay, I see. All right, go on, carry on. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm putting my new shoes on. Okay, so um, we'll keep on rolling along the timeline. Um, yes. In 1950, AA adopts its 12 traditions, which I'm guessing became the 12 steps. Is that no, right, Michael? No, no. 12 steps came first. Oh, well, AA one of the didn't, 12 AA, traditions. AA didn't have any steps when it first started, but a couple years later, they wrote up the steps. Um, okay. They were basically doing the 12 steps before... Uh, they wrote them down. Basically, when AA started, you know, what they did was they enrolled you into the town hospital, which we heard about earlier, the Dr. Towns Hospital. Even if you were from Skid Row, like, you know, the businessman in AA would pay to get you cleaned up. And then they'd uh, come into your room while you're kicking, you know, alcohol and having DTs and say, you know, get on your knees. Do you accept God to help you? And they're like, yes. And then they'd say, okay, now make a list of people you've harmed. And then be prepared to make restitution to them. And, you know, then we'll get you out. We'll buy you a suit and you'll go help other alcoholics. So, you know, the 12 steps, they kind of took those four steps and expanded them piecemeal mm. into the 12 steps to make them easier mm -hmm. to swallow. But okay. uh, the 12 traditions, the 12 traditions came much later. The 12 traditions are kind of the constitution of AA. It's uh, the 12 steps are about how you recover. The 12 traditions are how the groups operate. Uh, and how they interact with each other, how they're autonomous, how they're connected. And, uh, you know, I mean, one of them is like, you know, every AA group is autonomous except regarding uh, the, the fellowship as a whole. So you can't start the AA group where you drink, but you can start the AA group where you're naked, you know, because I wouldn't really affect <laughs> AA as a whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like I said, mistress of democracy and anarchy. There you go. Go to school naked. Go to AA naked. Anarchy, anarchy burger. burger. Oh, the government! <laughs> you like it. So, I do. Love that song. Um, so next in the timeline that I thought was relevant, and this kind of makes me think, oh, okay, so whoever wrote this timeline has some good in them, um, is they quote Ludwig von Mises yes, arguing they do. against government intervention in the <laughs> drug issue. Um and this is one of my favorite Mises quotes, and in fact, it's the basis for my sentiment of freedom of ingestion. And this is the quote, uh, quote, if the government is willing to determine what are, quote, bad drugs, what's next? Banning bad books, bad plays, art, music, the nope. mischief done by bad ideologies surely is much more pernicious than that done by narcotic drugs. Nice. Really? That's where you got your idea of freedom of ingestion from, was that quote? I don't know if it's where I got the idea, but... It was around the same time. I can't really remember which was first, but if if it didn't predate it, then it definitely enforced it as a 
as a moral idea in my head. I love my new sneakers, and I'm going to do a shout-out to them. It's uh, Saucony, S-A-U-C-O-N-Y. And now I guess I'll write them and ask for some money to keep saying that. So Is that the go. one where the logo looks like a little sperm? Uh, it kind of looks like a wave. I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know. DJ <laughs> said they're really good. And uh, I didn't... I I never find what I want in stores, man. So I just went on Amazon and got them. And they're That's great. the way to do it, man. You know, because I twisted my ankle the other day because I had these shoes that were so old that the bottom was flapping off them. And I was on my bed yep. opening my window uh, shade and I went to jump off and I like slipped and I twisted my ankle and it still hurts. And I'm like, I'm retiring oh. these shoes. I've had them since 2005. They were given to me uh, when I went to the Deauville Film Festival in France when they flew me out there to show the Selby movie. They, it was like, it was like, you know, real film festival kind of stuff. Like I've never been in any film festivals except that, you know, and, uh, the only one I was in was like a real one where like you walk in and they hand you like, you know, a bag with sneakers and an iPod and, you know, <laughs> a bunch of stuff. Uh, and the sneakers, you know, they took me in this room and I said, pick out which sneakers you want. What's your size? What is your size, Monsieur Dean? You know, <laughs> I don't understand why, why filmmakers need to be given sneakers by the film festival. <clears throat> Because Nike was endorsing, you know, was oh, helping pay for the film I festival. See. I see. Free gifts. Okay, fair enough. Because they um, hope you'll wear them on the red carpet when you have your picture taken. And everybody went the red par- carpet and got their picture taken. And they treat you like a rock star. And it's not just, oh, we're going to pretend even though we never heard of this guy. It's because next week you could be famous. So they want to, you know, they want you to remember that if they have you back, if they ask you back after you're famous. <laughs> right, right. They're hedging, hedging their bets. Yeah, I mean, Excellent. somewhere the, somewhere on the internet, there are pictures of me in Deauville, uh, you know, wearing a collared shirt, smiling, a lot thinner than I am now, like looking into the camera uh, with the, you know, the wall behind me. This is like Deauville Film Festival over and over, like they always have for that. And there were uh-huh. like, there were like a hundred people taking my picture at that time, like real nice. photographers with big cameras. And it was, it was kind of an interesting point and moment of my life. Yeah, I can you know, imagine. And then two weeks later, or like a week later, I was back in L.A. going like, how am I going to pay to wash my clothes? I don't have money for laundry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it beats being a drug addict, and I can thank AA for that. So go on. Sure does. Sure does. Um, I was going to make one more point about the Mises quote uh, about how, hey, you know, we can't ban bad drugs. What's next? Banning books? plays music art um the status take his yes. argument i feel and they, they they take it yeah exactly as a business the wrong plan. Way. they take it right. as a business plan <laughs> the status say yes we should that's a good idea you're right we ban drugs so why can't we ban uh speech ideologies gay marriage Sharia, i love that i love that i love that ron paul called that 1984 a business plan. business plan not yeah, just not great. just a day planner but a business plan yeah yeah, yeah. I, I hope that becomes meme like and everybody starts saying that about I guess more yeah. than just the the Republicans but also the Democrats too. So so let's jump ahead a little bit on this to your points only and I'll quit diverting because you and I have some personal stories. We do, but do you want to maybe save our stuff and uh, do a two parter? Next... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Let's not hurry it. Let's go leisurely through this. Okay, and then and, next? and for the next cast we're going to talk about sort of um, these things, what, what, what did you call them? My, my personal uh, experience is with something called impact training, uh, which is sort of a form of not attack therapy, but large group awareness training, which we're going to go into in a lot yeah, more detail. How, how basically in the 60s and 70s, a bunch of organizations kind of took the, the worst of drug rehab, what works in drug rehab, and combined it with like pop psychology, pop religion, and cult-like behavior, and uh, <laughs> did some really horrible things with it. Yes, and used it to prey on the uncertain in society, and you know, with some very bad results. Um, yes. But we're digressing too far. That'll be next. We were going to do it this podcast, but I think we're running out of time. Is here, there so. really a such thing as digressing on the Freedom Fiends, though? The whole I Freedom guess not, Fiends no. is a digression. Yes, it is one giant digression. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to digress from the digression, and we'll get back to um, to the history of drug rehab. Um, and I guess we'll still... So, so the last thing we talked about was the Mises quote, which is a great quote. Um We'll just go on to the next item. 1963, drug persecution becomes international with the single convention on narcotic drugs. Is that the and UN? It was an international treaty. I'm not sure if it was the UN or not. What's it called? I'll look it up. 
single the, convention. the single convention on narcotic drugs. I think it was just an international treaty. I don't know how or if the UN was involved. Um, but to me, uh, this sort yes, of leads... Yes, the United Nations was, Office okay. on Drugs and Crime, un, UNODUC, was delegated as the board's day-to-day -day work of monitoring the situation in each country. Really? And the UN was so young back then, too. I can tell UN shit by what it's called, man. It just jumps out at me. I can tell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh. Well, that's kind of a ballsy thing for them to do in, in sort of their teenage years. 1961. Um, 1963. Well, but, but you know, you have to remember things. a lot of people liked the UN because they thought it would prevent World War III. That's what it was invented yeah. for, or they right. said it was invented for. Right, right. And it hmm. really just means World War III is going to be an ongoing war <laughs> of UN nations against their citizens. Yes, exactly. Well put. Um, we're, and in then also, we're, in, we're in World War III. Also in the early 60s, uh, U.S. involvement in Vietnam and the slavery known as the draft, of course, led to a boom in That's new drugs. That's not what it acts. says. That's you're, you're editorializing. That's okay, but just pointing it out. I've been ed editorializing this whole time. <laughs> I'm picking out my points. And, There's no and facts in the Freedom Fiends. It's one big editorial, man. Well, no, I'm taking their, I'm I'm taking saying, their that's years. That's a good thing. That's a good and thing. And their facts. That's and I'm adding. Thing. I mean, otherwise, people You're could just look facts, up man. this. Everything yeah. that comes out of our mouth is fact, except <laughs> the things we're wrong on, which people correct us on. Right, right. Well, what's the point of just reading the whole timeline as written by drugrehab.org? Yeah, I mean, our listeners just... aren't listening to the drugrehab.org right. podcast. <laughs> is there one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know. There, God, I love these sneakers, man. Mm. But I, I, I think dancing. that's fair. You see me dancing? I don't. Okay, I see my head now. They say in AA... That to stay sober, there's two things you need. And this is not canonical AA. It's not in the book. But it's kind of implied in the book. But it's something they say in meetings. That to stay sober, you need something to do and someone to love. My wife is my someone to love. And my something to do is all this media we do yelling about liberty, man. Uh, your wife can't be both? <laughs> something to, she has something to do. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not sure if mine are reversed. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Let me think about that. Okay, go on. Go on. All right. So yeah, I, I think it's fair. I so, think wait, it's your wife is something to, to do. Your wife is something to do, and your podcast is something to love. Yes, that, so, that was okay. the joke. That was the joke. It was, it was. It was nothing but that, though. It was a joke. You love her. You love I her. Do. I can tell you I love do. her, man. I do. It's sweet. But yeah. But okay. So according to the drug rehabs timeline, a U.S. involvement or preparation for involvement in war ended up creating a whole new generation of drug addicts. In my editorialized version, though, I call it the slavery known as the draft because I think that that's keep talking. Sort of, I'll be right back. Cause someone's at the door again. Oh wow! <laughs> Another package. I think that's sort of the heart of it, right? I mean, you you kidnap all these young kids, uh, all these young adults, and you send them off to some hellhole. Um, you know, I'm not saying that Vietnam is a hellhole because it's Vietnam. I'm saying it was a war zone. Uh, ship them off there. They get shot at. Um, you know, it's of course, they're going to have horrible mental problems, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, you see it all the time. You go out in any street in any major city, you see Vietnam vets standing on the corner begging. Um, I did a story back in Wyoming about... Uh, what we called the park rangers, which were sort of the Native American, not all of them were Native American, but predominantly uh, alcoholics that hung around the park in the city center. Oh, you're talking the about cops park called rangers? Them, cops called them the park rangers, yeah. And, and the That's guy so that I insulting, used, man. It is, it is, but they, they, they own it. They say, yeah, I'm a park ranger. Um, <laughs> and, well, I was, I was tying that back to the Vietnam thing because the guy I profiled in that, he was a Vietnam vet. You know, he got shipped off to the war, um, and the way he describes it is, you know, I, I killed people. And he said that's one of the reasons he's an alcoholic and an addict now is because he, he, he's trying to get that right in his head because the, the average person isn't okay with something as traumatic I mean, as having about, to kill somebody else's think kid. Think about being drafted. Kids. Think about being drafted in Vietnam. I mean, I've talked to people, and I know we have listeners who are, and they, they can call in on the Sunday show. Yeah. I'd love it if they did. Uh it was different than it is now. I mean, war is horrible now, but it's kind of sanitized now. It's like it's voluntary, sort of. You know, they make you so poor you have to sign up. There's but, the poverty draft, you know, but yeah, there's that's much, different than the real draft. A lot, a lot of the killing is more remote. Uh, it's a lot more technological. Um, you're not sleeping in mud. You know, you're going back yeah. to a barracks generally now in the American Army. Um, 
in the 60s, it was like, you know, one day you're banging your hippie girlfriend in class and the next day they are shipping you off to basic to teach you how to use a machine gun for like a week. And, you know, basic's longer now, too. They kind of acclimate you to it. And then they would just ship you off and dump you in, a, in into a jungle with, you know, nine other dudes and say, go kill those people who are hiding behind the trees trying to kill yeah. you. And yeah. you had to or you die. Yeah. And, you know, people exactly. came back from that pretty screwed up. And also... People came back really screwed up. We talked about this before. In previous American wars, like World War II, they came back by ship, and they'd be like, it would take like two weeks to get from the battlefield to your hometown, and you could kind of like decompress and talk to other, you know, other guys and like work it out. And now it's like you're in the battlefield, and two days later you're back home, and uh, mm -hmm. that's that's why there's more. I don't know post traumatic stress. I don't know if there's more now than there was in Vietnam. I think there's a lot in Vietnam, and it was undiagnosed for decades. Oh yeah, yeah. I would I would probably buy that. I mean, I'm sure there's studies, so we could probably look up the actual fact, but um, I guess not right now. And so a lot of them, a lot of them got. I mean, you know, her, opium was cheap and heroin was cheap in Vietnam, very very cheap, like cheaper than beer and easier to get. And so was weed. And a lot of people came back from Vietnam addicted to heroin. And the ones that weren't using heroin there, a lot of them were wounded and came back addicted to morphine from their medical treatment. Ah, yeah, yeah, I could see that being a reason too. Hmm. Yeah. I got new keyboards too, man. Ooh. Man, Ooh, shopping. You're day. going on an online shopping spree. I then. do. I do. <laughs> I don't have to leave the house, man. It's great. Right. right. Um, so, in the midst of all this, to make matters worse, the government enslaves you, uh, throws you into a war zone. You you end up an addict. Um, but they're not done with you. Uh, this is where the state really sort of ramps up their war on drugs and the horribleness of this whole situation. Um, in 66, LBJ appoints the National Advisory Committee on Alcoholism, the Narco Narcotic Addict Rehabilitation Act also calls for increased federal involvement in addiction treatment. Um, we all know when the feds get involved in something, everything's going to get worse. Um, yeah. In the early 70s, the New York Narcotics Addiction Control Program allowed judges to commit addicts for compulsory treatment. So there you have a standard of the state forcing you to get treatment uh, regardless of your own volition, which, um, you know, I think that that will probably really reduce the success rates. I would imagine if, if you're – yeah, I, I feel like it has to come from within you. You have to want it. Um, you don't have to – I feel like you're going to be much more successful if it's something you're dedicated to uh, versus something a judge tells you to do. Yeah. Um, in the in 1978, the government continues on this tip. Nixon calls drug abuse drug abuse the nation's public enemy number one. Um, when I read that, I Nixon, thought Nixon was the public enemy number one. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Now, isn't that the pot calling the kettle black? Uh, Nixon calling something public enemy number one. I think you got that a little backwards, buddy. Um, Public enemy number one is something that the FBI invented. It was a hit parade <laughs> for gangsters. Oh, yeah. Is that, is, that, is that like the most wanted list kind of thing? Yeah. 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 Um, al although, you know, around the same time, people were buying it. Or a large number of, of Americans, at least according to Gallup polls, were buying it. 67% of Americans in one Gallup poll in 79 said that drug dealers should receive life sentences with no possibility of parole. That's so square, man. That's Life so square. sentences. My uh, dad you know, believe my dad believes that. Does he really? Yeah. Did did he believe it back in 1979? Well, of course, the government told him. Although now he doesn't love the government much. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm looking at my cop block article. I asked uh I asked Pete to add my name to it. My name wasn't on it. It was kind of weird. Uh, Which yeah, I, you know, it's weird. less a thing about like credit and more like it says written by cop block and i'm like no it wasn't <laughs> i am cop block we should all just say that no well i said there were signs that said i am ron paul at that ron paul yeah, thing yeah yeah <laughs> um so of course it doesn't end there uh in 81 nancy reagan i guess because she had nothing better to do Ugh. uh started the just say no campaign and um just say yo wasn't there a rap thing called just say yo i don't know but this i want to do a rap sa that says just say no to the state or just say no to cops i think that um, should have some punk rock in it man just say no to the state just say no like five voices chanting it 
Oh yeah, that's not bad. On the chorus, we'll do a punk rock chorus to a hip hop song. Okay, I mean that's what we, we do, do that all the time. That's we yeah, do, that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, um, the same year though, there was the the Fed's uh, zero tolerance campaign, which reduced support for treatment in prisons. Um, as a result, prisons flooded with addicts, and you know. I wasn't alive then, so I don't know how they really rolled out zero, zero tolerance, but I remember being in high school and, you know, our high school had this quote unquote zero tolerance policy about things like drugs and violence. And I just remember thinking, why would you want to name any program zero tolerance? And how do people get on board with something that yeah, is and, anti-tolerance? You know, the end result of that is this week, I wasn't going to touch on this because everyone's covered it, but it's kind of connected. There's a kid in a deaf school, oh, yeah. a little preschooler, who, uh, uh, his name is Hunter, and they want him to change his name because the, the sign language symbol for Hunter looks like a gun. <laughs> yes, I saw that. Uh, I was thinking, you know, the parents should just change his name to um, both his middle fingers extended high <laughs> towards the teacher. <laughs> call him victor and just say it's a v for victory <laughs> yes there victor you go. all right man i think we're uh at a good stopping point here uh okay okay we'll we'll resume with nancy reagan's just say no next time what year is that up to what are you at 84? uh 1981 81 all right that's 81, a good place to yes. stop Th- three years before i was born they were already just saying no <laughs> i remember that i was i was shooting heroin that year were you? Yeah. No, no, <laughs> I didn't just, start till eighty seven, but I was uh You, you were just was, saying no to quitting your drug addiction. I was drunk off my ass in uh eighty four. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Yep, yeah, we'll pick back up um in the next Wednesday cast as well as information about various um cult like pop psychology groups that will steal your sons and daughters and brainwash <laughs> them. Yes, that we've had experience with. Yes, yes. All right. Well, it's good chatting, man. Good chatting. Sure was, man. They took our what? They took our (laughs) herbs? They took our gerbs. They took our kids. They took our kids. How horrible. All right, man. Worms. Worms. Buy Freedom Fiends buttons. Buy Freedom Fiends buttons. Go to the website and look at the link that says buttons. Worms. That was live. That wasn't an ad. Good job, Michael. Worms. On your knees, you dirty hippies! On your knees! On your knees, you dirty hippies! On your knees! You've read books, attended lectures, and you know the Constitution well enough to know it's a well-crafted blueprint to create an ever-increasing federal empire. But there's still one thing missing. Buttons! Freedom Fiends now has buttons. We have Freedom Fiends, Anarchy Gumbo, and two designs for guns and weed the road to freedom. Wear them with pride. Use them to start conversations with statists. It's only $6 for four buttons, including shipping. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the link at the top that says buttons. Hello, Freedom Fiends. It's your boy, Dean. From the U.S., get the U.S. out my bloodstream. I owe me and that include endorphins. No one won't ask permission and I won't say please. Freedom fans, for fact that I gotta make clear it ain't about- The Freedom Fiends podcast is covered by a Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. Do what you want with it and spread it around. Tell two friends. Make copies. Email it to everyone you know. Go on the site and comment. This is a conversation. Every week, we'll have an exciting new episode where Michael W. Dean and Nima Badati weave their own unique take on the way the world works and how to find your place in it. Available from freedomfiends.com. That's F-R-E-E-D-O-M-F-E-E-N-S dot com. Freedom Fiends is proudly syndicated by Alterati.com and the Liberty Radio Network at LRN.FM. Subscribe and tell two friends. And remember, the only power they have is the power you allow them. We're not saying the Freedom Fiends are the one true path to anarchist liberation, but it's a good one. If you want to put your voluntarist money where your mouth is, consider making a donation to the Freedom Fiends. Go to freedomfiends.com and click on the spinning coin on any post. Then make a one-time gift via PayPal, or set up a monthly contribution of as little as $3. Giving to the Freedom Fiends helps advance education of horizontal liberation throughout the world. The Freedom Fiends. We work hard, so send us some money.